Oh, this way. <laughs> ah, this way. It's confusing. So we have this, uh, again, uh, there is a new startup competition. Uh, uh, there is a new startup that will join the startup competition today. And you go to facebook.com slash the web if you want to do this. It's only if you are here because we need to get you on stage this afternoon. So you get on stage during the startup competition if you're interested. And we'll pick one in the next uh, hour or two if I, uh, if I follow well because I've been here. Um, next up is... Uh, a dear friend of mine, Travis, uh, who has uh, uh, got an idea a few years ago. He was at Le Web, and I, I was with him, and he was in the streets of Paris. And for those of you who were at Le Web, at that time it was snowing, which is very rare in Paris that it snows, but it's even more rare that it uh, stays in sticks. And uh, we had, like, real snow here. And uh, he um, wanted a taxi and could not find one. And so he thought, how about a service that I would use on my phone to get a car, see the car coming, and then not use anything on my phone. And here is Uber. Travis, would you like to join us? Travis, how are you? Hey, how are you doing? Great to see you. Good to see you, too. I am glad to see you, because you're, uh, you're big now. I'm I mean, big. you're easy to catch. What you're not mean? easy to catch. You're what does that mean? You're big. You're, uh, I, I've read you, your last run was uh, just to get right into the more than $3 billion. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Valuation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that true? Yeah, it's true. Yeah, we, uh, we raised uh, around, uh, it was our Series C uh, in, we announced in August. Um, it was 200 and, about $260 million. Uh, you raised $160 million. $260 million. Uh, it was a pre-money of about 3.45. Yeah. I, it feels to me like, uh, you know, the theme is the next 10 years. And in the last 10 years, the unit has changed from millions to billions. You used to raise, you know, at a 3.5 million valuation. Yeah, I, startup. Look, I remember that too. I was there. Right. And Instagram sells for a billion. That's not yeah. enough. No, Snapchat refuses to sell for three billion. Yeah, we're, we're, we're going back to the late 90s. Oh, you think it's a bubble? I mean, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna say it's a bubble, but I'm gonna say that uh, there are a lot of companies out there that are getting pretty intense valuations without any revenues. It's insane. Yeah. When did you start Uber? Three years ago here, right? Three, so three and a half years ago is when we launched in San Francisco. We came up with the idea, we actually came up with the idea in, at La Web in 2008. You were stuck in the streets. We were stuck. Tell the story because I tell it, but it's not the same. Well, I mean, everybody here knows. No, no, right? tell the story. I mean, I like if, it. No, though the story is what everybody here knows is that it is hard to get a cab in Paris. In fact, I think it was, it may have been, I think it was 2008 or 2009 when I had to, when I was rushing in to get on a panel and I was basically sweating yeah. as I came on and I was, it was a mess. I remember. That's because I couldn't get a cab. So Paris was the inspiration for Uber. And so we went back to San Francisco and we created a very simple, you know, what was straightforward for us at the time was we wanted to push a button and get a ride. And we wanted it to be a classy ride. But tell me before, like, how did you realize this was the idea? Because I know before that, because we've known each other yeah. for a few years, yeah. you were just looking for an idea, right? And then it came to you that this is it, that's what I need so, to do. So this maybe goes to some of Guy Kawasaki's, like, how, his philosophy is that, you know, entrepreneurs often have 100 ideas. And then you're like, well, which one? It's the one that matches you, right? So if you know yourself, then the idea that, that makes sense is the one that matches you, right? Um, you know, if you're a great uh, basketball player, you don't get on the tennis court. It's that kind of thing. So knowing what you're good at, knowing who you are, being self-aware, and then you match your personality to the thing that you're gonna do, and when it works, it's magic. I'm very impressed, I have to say. So Thank tell you. me about the, the business. Now it's, uh, the press has been doing a really good job at reporting your numbers. <laughs> yeah, that's rough. I don't know if you, you guys have seen, but if you're on a, some kind of screen right now, which I see a lot of you have, 
if you Google, uh, or, or even easier, you go to TechMeme and you search Uber in there, and you will find the entire internal revenue reporting system of Travis on, uh, on the screen with uh, the number of cars being booked and the revenue. So your, your bookings are a billion dollars per year, I've read. You've read. And about 200 uh, million is your net revenue. I mean, uh, look, all I'll say is that we are, you know, we've, we've found product market fit and, um, <laughs> and we're growing quite fast. So whatever you saw online, uh, you know, it, it was not representative of everything that we do, but it was, it was, certainly, uh, it was certainly a screenshot of some of our internal, uh, sort of our that internal be horrible tools. horrible as a CEO to see that kind of well, thing. Well, here's the thing, and I think people didn't understand. They're like, why is Travis so upset? The numbers are so good. Um, because at, my, at Uber, we have an incredibly transparent culture. It, people can see everything inside. Inside, you can see everything. Um, it empowers people to feel ownership and to go and build their version of a startup within Uber. Because remember, we're operating in 62 cities around the world. Each of those little offices in each of those cities is like a startup. And so they feel that ownership because of that transparency. When that data gets out, then I have to reconsider some of those policies around transparency, and that hurts the culture of the company. It? Well, we haven't yet, but those are the types of things we have to think about. If it becomes something that happens, I've got to change, because that data becomes a weapon for other people to learn the lessons that we learn, right? So how much are we growing? What's working? What's not? Um, those are things we learn through A-B testing, through invention, through innovation, uh, through being operational. And if other companies can learn those lessons without doing it, then we lose a competitive advantage. And so there's this tension between making sure that we can compete vigorously that we're in, in, while being transparent internally and not letting our, you know, not letting folks who want to, you know, who, who basically are our clones learn the things that we already know. Tell me about your uh, competition, since you're talking about it. What, what's, um, what is it? Is there something yeah. major, someone major that you're looking at? I mean, there's, at? there's probably two, there's two categories, or, or you know, uh, let's say two categories. There's North America and there's China, is really how I think about our competition. Uh, in China, you've got a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, sort of clones that, that work on taxis in China. To give you an example, right? San Francisco has 1,500 cabs. New York has 13,250. Mm -hmm. Beijing has 60,000. Okay, Seoul, 60,000, right? So Asia is a big market for us. We're in Seoul, Kuala Lumpur, Tokyo, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, Shanghai, Singapore. I mean, we're all over the place with in Asia. With regular cabs? No, with, no, no, no. We're, no, it's the Uber that you know. So oh, it's really? nice, yes. Black cars. Yes. Um, my point is there are clones in China that have real traction in China, and that's something we think about, okay? Um, the second is uh, sort of the ride-sharing, you know, sort of the, the ride-sharing category where it's essentially not commercially licensed, um, not sort of traditional commercial insurance, um, has been sort of an interesting disruption on Uber, even though we're three and a half years old, that's an interesting disruption that I think we've really met that disruption pretty well, but it's something we keep our eyes on. But because all the uh, like traditional taxi companies have yeah. kind of an Uber now, right? If, I don't know, in Paris I took, uh, we call it G7, yeah, yeah, G7. you know them, yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah, familiar. And uh, they have their app, it's kind of the same, sure. right? You see the car coming, and you cannot pay though. Uh, no, can you pay? Maybe, uh, I don't know. The, the thing is, is that the taxi, so here's an example. In New York, there are 13,250 taxis, like I described. Today, do you want to guess how many taxis there were in 1949 in New York? 13,250, all right? So basically what's happened is they've, they, you know, the taxi lobby has made it so there's no more taxis so that they can create artificial scarcity to make the license to own and operate a single taxi worth a lot of money. One license to operate a single taxi in New York is worth $1.1 million, right? 
So, and it's the same here, by the way, right? Yeah, it's the yeah, same here, and it's the same in most cities around the world. And so what that creates is scarcity. Um, scarcity around uh, cars that can get people around the city. Uh, and so you can build the coolest app in the world on top of a taxi system. You're still gonna, going to wait. It's still, you're either going to wait, you're going to get shitty service. Basically, the problem is that in, in cities around the world, taxis have been regulated in this crazy way where there's fixed supply and there's fixed price. And then, so, so that, that's this regulated sort of, you know, I don't know if you call it a cartel, but it's essentially this weird industry. And what we do is we come from the outside and create a, a, a very, uh, it's basically a marketplace around it that has flexible supply, flexible price, that's constantly trying to find the equilibrium between supply and demand, and you just eat it alive. Because your prices are flexible, right? The New prices York, are, if it's big price, it's, it's uh, raining, yes. you don't fight So if it's cars. raining, what happens is the price goes up, more cars come on the system, um, and, you're and like, fewer oh, it's, people get stranded. It's double price, right? Up to it, double could, price. it could be, like on New Year's, it could go seven times as expensive on New Year's Eve. That was, but but that was normally very, it's like a two, you know, it, it's one to two X type of thing normally. That was a very interesting move you did. It's like, you want a car? Great, it's going to be five times the price. Right. You'll get it, but... Well, that's the thing, is we stand for reliability, right? So sometimes people go, they get a little upset about surge pricing because, well, nobody likes when the price goes up. Of course, it happens in hotels, it happens in you know, airlines and a whole bunch of other businesses, um, but they're just not used to it with cars. And they, they get a little upset about it, and they, you know, I go to those people and I say, um, you know, we're going to add a feature that's going to make surge pricing optional. And Tell they get all excited about that, and I say, how are you going to do it? And then I say, well, we're just, when, when surge pricing is happening, we're just going to tell you there's no cars available. So the thing is, what we're doing is we're providing people an option. And some people aren't happy that that option is more pricey, but when the price goes up, more cars come on, fewer people get stranded. Tell me about the Uber for this and Uber for that. There is a lot of you. You've become a world, basically, right? Yeah. You've become a category on your own. I'm glad I'm not an angel investor right now. <laughs> That's, uh, that would be intense. Um, the, the way we think about Uber is it's the cross between lifestyle and logistics. Lifestyle is give me what I want and give it to me right now. What we're used to on the internet for the last 15 years of just clicking and getting stuff, but now it's logistics where it's we're delivering it, we're physically delivering it. So give me what I want, give it to me right now, and then deliver it, that's Uber. So if somebody's doing Uber for X and it- That's Uber for cars, right? Well, no, I, that's the high level of how I view Uber. Oh, so you think Uber will, your plan is to exp expand into other categories? The, what cars I'd say, is just the, the, the beginning. What, I, what I'd say is the way we think about it is that Uber is an urban logistics fabric. Right? So we are in the business of delivering today, we are in the business of delivering cars in five minutes. But once you're delivering cars in five minutes, there's a lot of things you can deliver in five minutes. Right? So like we, do, we have fun, right? We did Christmas trees, we did on-demand Christmas trees last week. We've done on-demand ice cream, we've done on-demand roses, like on Valentine's Day, it's made a lot of guys, like they went from zero to hero, right? Five minutes you were delivering uh, flowers? Yeah. I highly recommend it. And then we had an extra, an extra option where you could do flowers with a serenade. It works. So that's the lifestyle part, right? But are it's you upset capturing... that this is all happening, that they're kind of like uh, copying your model, and you're not fast enough? And I mean... You invest in the startups, you're saying, yourself? No, no, no. I, the, what I like to say is Uber, Uber is my wife, and I have no mistresses. So... Um, which may be strange with a French audience, I don't know. I will not. Um, so, <laughs> We've been talking around. about love every single session. I don't know how this is happening. Um, I don't know, uh, <laughs> I have no idea, Travis. Tell me what you did yesterday night, maybe I, I can help. Uh, what did I do yesterday night? I, how much did you party? I did not. Ah, well, that's why then. Yeah, well, I've got a wife. Um, wow, I don't know where this is going. I, you started it. <laughs> I'm sorry, it is my fault. <laughs> All right, so tell me about uh, the Uber clones. Yeah, so, so what happens is, is that if somebody is doing Uber for X, whatever it is, and it, cross, it, it matches that sort of lifestyle and logistics thing, you can count on Uber doing it. 
Oh, okay. So if you guys uh, right. want to so, start so something, it's, that's that how we think of it. And what the so and then delivery, the, for example, there are a number of startups like, in San Francisco trying to deliver stuff to you. I'm not going to food. Yeah, I get it. It's, it's everything. It's I get it. But the, the point is, is you're going to compete with them. I'm. What I, I know what you're trying to do, Loic. So, so the, I'm not going to comment on any specific thing, but I'll just say that that we think of that as being Uber, and uh, and so they should just count on us at some point being there. Mm. I'm um, just trying to be, a, you know, to provocative. get this. No, entertaining. That's, oh, that's... I love it. <laughs> so, what's the next one you're going to launch? Uh, we are doing right now. We are we are we are delivering cars, right? And we are working. We're, I mean, we're we're rolling out a lot of cities in Asia. We're rolling out in South America. We're in Bogota and Cali. That's crazy. We're in Mexico City. Um, so you're busy. We're busy. We're in Dubai, Abu Dhabi. Um, we actually have operations in each of these cities. Um, it's pretty interesting. Tell me about all the legal crap you're going through. You have this mm. wall in your office. <laughs> we, which you do I? What, what are we so talking you about? You posted the picture of all the letters you receive, right? Oh, I or you want I, to do this? Oh, maybe I want to. I mean, yeah, you, I, you I could get, definitely, I could definitely wallpaper my office or our office with uh, cease and desist letters, for sure. In fact, we got a cease and desist letter from New Orleans, and we're not even operating there. <laughs> like, they, they sent us a cease and desist letter. We do not have an office there. There are no cars on the ground. You open the app, it says, we do not operate here. But we got a cease and desist letter from that city. The thing that I think we're realizing, and that technology entrepreneurs are realizing, is that just because somebody sends you a cease and desist letter, like, well, when somebody sends you a cease and desist letter, it mean, all it means is that somebody doesn't like you. It does not mean you're doing anything wrong. It just means somebody doesn't like you. And if you are... If well, the you, problem is you have to react already, right? If you're sued, you have to... Well, it's not a suit. What's your uh, no, legal... No, no, it's just a nasty gram. It's, it's like a love letter a except gram. a hate letter or something. It's just saying, I don't like you. But then you're sued as well, right? No. What's your legal budget per month? <laughs> I would say a million dollars a month. Mm. More? I don't know if it's that much. I don't think it's that but much. I'm not going to go there. Come on. Um, we have, here's, here's what I'd say. We have three attorneys <laughs> on staff at Uber. OK, um, so that's already half a million dollars a year or more. A year? Yeah. Fair. I'm trying to get to my okay. budget. Fair, I, right? I, I get it, yeah. OK. And then we have law firms around the world that we work with, probably like 50 different law firms. Yeah, that's a lot of money. Yeah. Tell me about France. Is that true that there is this law? I don't even know being French. So uh, yeah, 15 minutes delay on. Well, the fr so we're doing great here in Paris. I mean, the service is really good here. And you remember at the beginning, it was not as great at the beginning. It took us time I to took get the there. The first one, the very no, first I, one. I know you were our writer zero here in Paris, and so. It's really good, but the problem, the problem is, is it's so good that then the taxi industry then gets upset. And the government. The taxi industry gets upset. Taxi industry. Taxi industry talks to the government, tries to get laws passed that outlaw competition. And so the thing that they're trying to get passed right now is a regulation that makes it so that no, no livery car, essentially no black car, no Uber, can, like, basically you have to wait 15 minutes. If you request the car and it comes in five, you have to stare at that car for 10 minutes more before you're legally allowed to get in the vehicle. That is the law they're trying to pass. Oh, it's not passed. It's not passed, no. And so... We have two ministers coming on Thursday. You're welcome to come back if you want. Say that one more time. We have two French ministers yeah. coming on Thursday. Mm, interesting. It may be that they avoided this day so that they don't cross your path. I don't know. No, I mean, I, my, I'm not... Uh, I, you talk I, to them? I don't. Why not? Because it's a waste of time. <laughs> um, so what do you do? You uh, stop that. We just continue. What we you do. You keep going. What but we do. Gonna be we hit, roll out a service that people love. But if it's a 15 minutes slow, you have you'll have to obey by. Well, right? if they try to pass that law, there are going to be so many people upset, hmm. right? And so what happened is when they first proposed it, then our customers spoke out, and that's what slowed the whole thing down. And that's been playbook from the beginning. And you have that in New York too, or other places? I mean, there are definitely what, other places. 
Is the French like the worst? I would say the, the French is not. The French are actually some of the the best on this front, actually. With a 15-minute delay law? It I doesn't exist. The law doesn't exist. It's just a proposal. We've seen crazier proposals. The point is, is that... What's the most crazy proposal you saw? Oh, here's a good one. You. Okay, so here's one. So in Seoul, Korea, Uber is 100% legal. We operate in Seoul. Unless the passenger is Korean. <laughs> That's a frickin' law. Okay, so if you are handicapped, a senior citizen, or a foreigner, you can get chauffeured car service in Seoul. If you are Korean, you cannot. That's real. That's, that's pretty bad. Yeah, that's the worst. I actually, there's a criminal complaint against Uber in Seoul, and so in this little trip that I'm doing right now, this business trip, I was in Seoul getting interrogated by a police, uh, by an investigator at the police department for three and a half hours. I've got a picture afterwards, like he wanted a picture with me after, it was kind of weird. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to post it, I'll post it after this just you so should. it's out there, it's awesome. Um, yeah, post I, maybe, it. I, maybe we sort of brought him over to our side, I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, these are protectionist laws, right? They want tourists to have a good experience when they go to Seoul, but they're protecting the taxi industry from all of the residents of Seoul, 20 million people, from getting a, a better quality of service ride. So you're disrupting entire, like, what is it? I mean, it's ten, like hundreds of years old industry? Yeah, and well, and what it is is that it's, it's the industry, but then it's also these crazy backroom deals that get done that make cities worse, that have been done for decades, centuries, that now technology is making it so that these things are not possible because we know, and people can speak out, and they can do so very quickly. So that's, that's the way you deal with it? You have your legal we, lawyers, we, like your lawyers in-house, in but we, you, in the regulatory, you ask your users in the, to say, hey, complain. In, in the regulatory world, there's inside game and there's outside game. Uber has great outside game, which means that the customers really like the service, they speak up for it, and they, they gum up, they slow down the political process that's trying to outlaw alternatives. I'm going to start pacing pretty soon. You got me riled up. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. I, I love it. All right. What's, uh, what's coming next? Are you just like going city by city? What, what's your team like? Like how big of a team do you have? So we're 500 people. Wow. Um, 200 are in SF, and then the others are spread around the world in the, in the different offices. What's coming in the next like three, five years? I mean... Uh, do you need to go public, for example, or you don't care? You might, because you raised a lot of money. I, yeah, I always ask when somebody asks, are we going to go public, I say, why? Well, you, you've probably, you're probably close to a 500 uh, shareholders limit to begin that with. That doesn't exist anymore. Oh, that is limit that is gone. gone. Yeah, that limit is, is gone. It? Thank you for correcting um, my uh, knowledge about No, no, it's okay. It's a, recent, <laughs> it's a recent change. Is it? Um, so that's not an issue. And so maybe at some point your, your employees want liquidity and then... Yep. You may have to do it. You may have to find well, some like way for them Phil to get Libin liquidity. Philippe was just saying maybe your customers want to buy some of the company. Well, certainly the drivers, the, the transportation providers we partner with, they definitely want to buy... taxi drivers. They we'll want to buy some Uber stock for sure. Yeah, maybe yeah, we drivers. figure out ways for them to do that. That'd be kind of fun. So what's, what, what's, what's so coming next? We're, so the first thing is we need to get... We're trying to get stamp out this urban logistics fabric in every city in the world. Um, and then it's thinking about what are the other things we can do um, with that fabric. Um, and so I think there's going to be interesting ideas coming for us in 2014. Um, but it's really just getting in all these places, going deep in those places, and then extending the number of services that we offer in those places. That's how we think about it. And for us, you know what? That's like the big picture stuff. Like for us, it's just going to work every day, innovating, having a freaking great time with really, really awesome people. That's kind of how we roll. Travis, it's, it's a fascinating story that three years ago you have this idea and today it's a $3.5 billion company with 500 employees. I'm like so impressed. Yeah. So c can you share just some advice as a, we're over time unfortunately, yeah. but as a, like, a, you know, like how, how do we build the next $3 billion company in this room right now? Like you did, right. or I outside mean, in the street. How do you get this idea? How would you tell us to yeah. 
think to get that idea. I mean, I, I, were you worried it would be so big when you? We never. Well, we still don't think of it like that, right? Again, it just comes back to knowing yourself, knowing what you like to do, and then just go do it. And and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Put your heart and soul into it. Um, you know, I've got these socks here. There, I know everybody's talking about Uber, socks. This, that... this says blood, sweat, and ramen. Okay, so everybody talks about blood, sweat, and tears. But I, my last company, I did four years without a salary, and so I ate a lot of ramen. So it's blood, sweat, and ramen. And so sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes it's hard. But if you enjoy what you do, then none of that matters. How about the idea? How do you get the idea? Oh, I mean, you just. You got to have ideas. If you don't have ideas, then maybe you should join somebody else's idea. <laughs> right? It's true. Yeah. You'll be around, Travis? Yeah, I'll be around. I'm here through tomorrow afternoon. Is there a way that the press or the bloggers can like interview you or meet you? I mean, I'm how doing a ton of interviews today. Uh, how do we contact you? What's the best? Twitter? Yeah, I mean, Travis the best K? way is Travis at Uber.com. Travis at Uber.com. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Excellent. Cool. Thanks so much, Travis. Yeah, I'll see you, you around. Yeah, I'll be I here. I want to party tonight. All right, very good. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Yeah.